cost loss. It can be net biodiversity gain. It can also be net profit gain. So let's be on the forefront of calling in our other uh, agencies to really work with us to ensure infrastructure which supports conservation is also viable as a business. These conversations have not happened in this country across the sectors and would be keen to hear from the rest of us. How can we make that happen? And number two, what do we now need to do with the opportunity we have in reviewing the act to include language and uh, requirements that can be enforced um, to reduce mortality and the negative impacts to biodiversity. Thank you, Steve, and uh, looking forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for those uh, remarks. Uh, I now want to hand over this session to Tobias. Uh, Tobias is, um, has spent quite a lot of time on uh, climate change issues and infrastructure development. And this is actually the second uh, um, um, uh, paper that he's sharing with us uh, under the Conservation Conversations uh, Forum. So Karibu, Dr. Tobias, your floor is now yours. Uh, many thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Um, hmm, so that should be the presentation. And then share that. I uh, Is it up there? Yes, it's it's there now. Excellent. So uh, uh, let me just try to see if it will be able to move. Sometimes they freeze a lot. Uh, oh, good. I think it's moving. Yeah. Lovely. Wow. So thank you so much, everybody, and uh, I, I want to thank you personally for allowing me to have this opportunity to share some of uh, you know, the things we are doing in relation to infrastructure and development, I mean infrastructure development and conservation broadly, but also specifically looking at some of the you know, negative impacts of such uh, development projects, uh, because most of the conversation revolves around the positive impacts, you know, things like economic gains, uh, economic development, improvement of you know, uh, livelihoods and the rest. But most of the time, we really tend to sideline or give a blind eye to some of the benign and negative impacts that in the long term might just end up negating some of the so-called positive uh, benefits. Uh, secondly, I'm glad that this talk is coming uh, hot in the heels of the previous talk about public engagement, uh, I mean public environmental litigation, because some of the impacts we will be looking at are actually drawn from the public per uh, perception to start with. But also there are things that are actually enshrined in law in the country, both in the constitution and various environmental and natural resource management legislation and acts. And therefore, it calls into question why we have such kind of robust rules and regulations as well as policies, but we still suffer lots of environmental uh, losses or environmental negligence as a result of our appetite for uh, development in isolation. Uh, beyond that, uh, there is another paper we've just submitted that now looks more deeply into matters of environmental safeguards and how this might have not been or have been done properly in the country insofar as the development projects such as the SGR and the LAPSET are concerned. And of course, the intention is not to criticize per se, but to offer, uh, you know, uh, into some of the gaps that might have been uh, ignored and that have led us to where we are today. And also I appreciate the fact that uh, insofar as, uh, you know, the fight, if I would use that word, against environmental degradation in relation to transportation infrastructure development and other development projects in the country is concerned, uh, I wouldn't really tout myself as one of the people really, you know, talking so much about it, but I think the Conservation Alliance of Kenya, uh, through its membership as early as, uh, you know, 2013, 2014, have always been at the forefront of to highlight some of these impacts. And we credit uh, the Development Corridors Partnership Project's inception and its uh, you know, success today to some of those uh, you know, opportunities that were created by the previous uh, individuals who advocated uh, for some of the uh, you know, accountability as well. And of course, the bigger picture here is to ensure that some of these development projects are actually implemented in a manner that is inclusive, participatory, but also resilient. Steve just mentioned matters climate change. 
And I think for those of us who travel and uh, read the news and pay attention to various articles here and there, you must have read a lot about various road sections collapsing across the country, uh, you know, embankments, particularly in the coast. Last uh, Over December, I was in Mombasa, and you, we took lots of pictures and videos of the entire embankments collapsing. Uh, earlier on, you might have also, you know, read about various sections of the SGR around uh, Gong area collapsing down in Savo collapsing. Now, all these are matters that are linked to uh, climate change that might have not been incorporated in insofar as the design and implementation is concerned. So our job in Corridors Partnership, as Lucy mentioned, it, is to try to highlight some of this evidence to support uh, responsible design, uh, implementation and maintenance of this infrastructure, not to stop them, but to ensure that their contribution to national development is anchored on environmental responsibility. Specifically today, I'll be talking about a portion of that research work that we've done that builds on public perception. As it were, we know that some of these projects succeed or fail depending on public support or not. And therefore, if the public perceives that uh, some of these projects have got negative impacts, then we are bound to suffer massive losses, even as a government. But if they perceive them to have uh, you know, positive contribution, not just to their lives, but also to their environment, then chances are they will support them and provide better anchorage for some of these projects to be seen to its conclusion. So the, uh, the paper I'll be presenting today is basically looking at public perception and how important it is to think about uh, general public as a major contributor to scientific research in a manner that informs ongoing monitoring as well as future more data-based research. Uh, the study basically, uh, the title of the paper itself is Assessing the Ecological Impacts of Transportation Infrastructure Development with a specific focus on the railway, on the standard gauge railway in Kenya, based on a reconnaissance study. So basically visiting some of the key actors, visiting the communities, uh, you know, physically visiting some of those areas where the construction is going on and collecting data on a first-hand basis without engaging in a more rigorous long-term monitoring at that stage. But as of now, we will be coming up with other publications that now are based on more long-term data and monitoring projects. And of course, this is part of the Development Corridors Partnership, as Lucy mentioned, which is made up of institutions from the UK, that's University of Cambridge, uh, uh, London School of Economics, University of York, amongst others, uh, partners from China, who are the main funders of some of these projects, and therefore their inclusion in the project is to ensure that whatever information and data and the evidence we gather really find a home where it is needed most. And of course, the research, has, uh, the research team in Kenya, that's the University of Nairobi's Institute for Climate Change and Adaptation and the African Conservation Center that are leading matters of research and policy uh, inclusion and also engaging with the government and other partners to ensure that where these projects are implemented on the ground in Kenya, some of this responsibility is anchored and the data is used to inform some of those actual construction activities. Uh, I will not bother with the outline, it's pretty much clear, background and then of course the study itself and the methodology. You might be able to read much about, I'll not delve so much into the background because it's all available in the paper, but I'll talk about the broad issues that I think uh, we need to take into account, but also the ones that I think we've really encountered as, uh, you know, partners working in conservation. And along the SGR corridor, you must have encountered a lot of this, some of which might not have been captured in this paper, but welcome contributions to help us going forward. So basically, I think Matters Transportation Corridor, or rather Transportation Infrastructure Development, is not, is not a new phenomenon across the world, but it's really, uh, you know, taking center stage, particularly in the sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a, a new push for economic, social, and cultural emancip uh, emancipation. And therefore, most of the governments are investing millions of dollars and uh, getting international support from both uh, and the uh, international donors to try and put in place infrastructure with the hope that uh, it will improve the movement of goods and services within and between countries and contribute to major economic, social, and cultural growth and integration. And these ones have been confirmed to have happened uh, as they offer potential to diversify and improve livelihoods. I think a good example that we came across was where, uh, you know, people from northern Kenya, uh, the northern frontiers like Turkana, are now feeling they have more connectivity to the city of Nairobi and they can easily proceed all the way to Mombasa with a lot of ease as of 
initially. And that's a positive outcome of these investments. It ensures that people feel they, are, they have equitable access to some of the resources that never, they never had. Issues of development opportunities tend to spread to some of those remote areas, whereas the poor and marginalized communities tend also to start seeing themselves as part of the mainstream communities in the countries. And that enables uh, you know, countries and regions to achieve some of those major flagship goals. So, for instance, Kenya, we have got uh, the sustainable development, I mean, uh, the uh, vision 2030. And of course, other countries have got their own visions as well. And all these are interlinked in a manner that they feel that uh, connectivity through infra infrastructure, we are able to achieve a lot. Uh, so, with that push uh, over the recent past, there has been a huge you know, investment in transportation infrastructure, particularly in the sub-Saharan Africa, where it is estimated that close to over 90% of the new infrastructure is being constructed uh, with the support from uh, you know, particularly the West. You must be familiar with the China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative that is investing huge sums of monies in expanding infrastructure and other trade opportunities with the African countries. And of course, other Western countries are falling there's a bit of you know uh, uh, matters that go with them insofar as environmental and social accountability and regulations are concerned. However, as we, we've read in other uh, you know publications, our colleagues or our funders from uh, China really don't have much to do with environmental accountability, and therefore they have become the major funder of some of these projects. And therefore, we said, we feel that they need to really be given some of the information to ensure that they are able to rethink their strategies. Some of these are targeting railways, roads, and power lines. And of course, Lucy has just mentioned what happened this morning or last evening in, a, in, in a northern Kenya. Uh, we've got lots of work that has been done by Nature Kenya as well on matters of uh, you know, vultures and the, and, and the wind turbines across other parts of the country. Roads, we've seen a lot of data flowing now since we started the Kenya Roadkill Working Group. Lots of data coming in about wildlife being slaughtered on the roads, uh, you know, unhindered, and several other impacts that are coming on board. And all those, uh, you know, stuff are supported and being expanded quite regularly. However, railways tend to be, you know, favored particularly uh, by most of the African governments today because of what they think are economic and environmental advantages. So across the globe, it's, an, uh, it's kind of uh, you know, postulated that by 2050, we are likely to see over 300,000 plus kilometers of railway tracks across the, uh, across the globe. And like I mentioned, most of this is now targeting developing countries uh, under the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, where they feel they can be able to connect the entire globe and enhance trade and connectivity. What is missing in all this discussion is where is the environment, where is the culture, where is the, you know, the social aspects of all these uh, investments? It, it's all banked or rather pegged on the dollar sign. How much money, how much GDP is going to emerge, but not how much of the environment is going to be impacted upon or lost in the process. And in the long term, this might have uh, serious consequences. Within that confine then, Kenya being one of the you know, countries placed to benefit through this, initiated the standard gauge railway corridor sometime back and this has really been seen as a flagship project for the country that is pegged on the vision 2030 development agenda if you look at part 3.4 under infrastructure it envisaged that uh, kenya will be a country firmly interconnected through a network of roads railways ports airports water and sanitation facilities and telecommunications and of course true to its word i think we've all been a witness to all this taking place concurrently with dams and mega dams being constructed and airports all over the country as well as different ports in railways coming through and of course lapset with all its co uh, con uh, constituents have been part of this however the sgr in, on its own forms part of the east african railways master plan and the eastern african sgr regional network and what that means is that there's very little control insofar as what Kenya does in isolation, but it fits into the bigger infrastructure development agenda of not just the East African region, but also the African uh, community as a whole. And this has been you know, passed through different frameworks and, and presidential decrees, and you will remember that uh, one uh, Honorable Raila Odinga uh, is one of the infrastructure ambassadors, and it's a, a continent-wide project. The challenge we have is all their discussions and you know uh, plannings are pegged on one thing, which is basically economic emancipation, uh, economic development and growth. So the overall aim of the SGR is basically to rejuvenate existing railways, 
serving Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. And of course, it's expected that it will make extensions to other parts of the, of, of, of the Eastern African region. And it goes up to Douala in Cameroon to join the the port of Cameroon, all the way to port of Mombasa, in a cross, uh, in, a, in a wider African uh, transportation network. How these are going to be implemented pegs or other rests with the individual government institutions that are working in collaboration to ensure they work. So the pictures on the left, uh, on, the, on the right of your screen, I believe, is just showing you know part of the com completed SGR uh, running through Savo area, and below it is the map of the entire proposed stretch from Mombasa through Nairobi, Narok, all the way to Kisumu City. And you will recall that uh, when it got kind of stopped for a while, and now there are different plans and designs being implemented going to Kisumu that are still uh, you know, under scrutiny. And a lot has been said as to why that is happening with some of our colleagues from the University of Cambridge are working on, and soon they might be coming up with a paper to give us some insights into some of the key challenges uh, with the progress of the entire uh, you know, uh, construction. Interestingly, we'll notice that it all pegs on people what people think, what people want, and what people envisage, and their ambitions. And that really brings into, into fore what we're doing with this paper today, which is to try and bring to the fore people's voices, the local communities' voices, professionals, like people in the conservation sector, and why they think the way they think, and why their, their views matter, insofar as the sustainability of these projects are concerned. Uh, within Kenya, the SGR traverses key conservation areas or key areas that really, we really value as people in conservation and development. Uh, for instance, some of these are protected areas in Savo East and Savo West, which I think we are uh, familiar with. Uh, up in Nairobi, we are all aware through Nairobi National Park. And of course, some of the impacts in these areas have been contested, some have been verified, but it's, it's still research or other work in progress. In most parts, again, it runs through community and private conservancies, uh, where, I mean, which are key dispersal and races on grazing areas and breeding zones and refuges for threatened wildlife species. And they also offer significant or important landscape connectivities. Again, so if you look at some of the, you know, if you look at the, uh, the connectivity reports that have been produced in the country, some of those areas are actually important insofar wildlife movements are concerned, but they have all been cut through or fragmented or blocked all the same. So we are in a situation where we have to rethink how these wildlife are going to survive. Beyond that, it also runs through important or critical water sources. This includes both surface and underground water areas, and that has got an implication in terms of the quantity and quality of that water. Uh, so we will see in our results issues of water contamination and water pollution either occur during construction and they still continue to occur. And in case of a major accident, this will be quite massive. So how the planning goes forward is quite significant. Uh, some of these are important watersheds that are either being degraded or uh, they are critical wetlands, as we've seen in our results, that have also been you know, rendered uh, unuseful. And, and, and we know the value of some of these watersheds and wetlands insofar as ecosystem services are concerned. So their uh, you know, de uh, degradation, destruction, and fragmentation is quite critical because we are going to lose important ecosystem services that can also help uh, you know, uh, sustain economic development. Beyond that, there are issues of increased water plus water scarcity, as some of the cities emerge and new settlements emerge along the corridors, chances are that those communities will demand additional water supply. And with the rivers and, and the other water sources already degraded, we are likely looking at a dire situation where we'll not be able to supply adequate water uh, resources or water for some of these populations. Uh, beyond that, some of the remote and fragile ecosystems that they traverse really are characterized by low human population. And that's one of the things that was considered in their construction to try and avoid where people, uh, where settlements are dominant. However, those critical human population areas are, are also quite important because they are very fragile insofar as climatic, uh, climate change is concerned, as far as their resilience is concerned, and as far as their provisions to other critical ecosystem services within those locations. And therefore, the thinking that they are not very useful and therefore can just be degraded anyhow should really be disabused because they support some of the poor and marginalized communities. As we know, in northern Kenya, for instance, where the Lapset corridors traverse, I think those of us working in those areas will tell you some of the challenges they have faced. But along the SGR, again, particularly areas that are dominated by the pastoralist communities, uh, there was a paper that published some time back about the implications 
there to be communities, and it's quite there. Very important not just to look at the economics and assume those areas don't support any significant populations, but they have very serious implications. They are very fragile insofar as climatic uh, changes are concerned. But also, in, in, it, it therefore poses potential threats. At this stage, when we publish the paper, we have not done much research, so we still treated this as potential, uh, you know, threats to the survival of wildlife species, quality and quantity of underground and surface water resources, and that extends to the access and use of these natural resources by the local communities. Impacts really goes beyond just the ecology, ecology but also uh, human populations living in these areas. So sometime, I mean, most of the work that has been done really has focused on roads. I think uh, we've read a lot about the road ecology, and the railway ecology is just emerging. Uh, this is because railways have not really been very expansive. Uh, in, the, in our context in Kenya, I think we've had the old uh, one meter, uh, the old meter gauge railway for quite some time. Nobody has really bothered with these impacts for long because it was rarely utilized. Uh, however, with the SGR and with the international attention, and the, you know, all the media attention that it, 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 uh, it received, it became a major focal point. And therefore, people started really highlighting the impacts and the feeling that it really needs to be researched came into the fore as they constitute what we call the disturbance corridors. Just like every other uh, you know, linear infrastructure, they tend to have a bit of uh, issues uh, with natural resources as they disrupt some of these uh, homogeneous uh, landscapes. And therefore, there's also growing recognition of some of these impacts across the globe, uh, particularly in the remote areas that uh, there's need to apply uh, some of these impacts and then offer mitigation uh, measures. So in our case, therefore, uh, we, we felt that, uh, you know, it's important for Kenya particularly to look through some of these impacts uh, for various reasons, but, but particularly as the country's commitment to international initiatives for the protection of biological diversity. Uh, if, if, if you look at some of the other results that we'll be showing in, in, in uh, future webinars, things like, uh, you know, road kills are targeting some of the most uh, critically endangered wildlife species, across the country and they are destroying some of the critical habitats in the country and what that means that insofar as attaining biological uh, or rather uh, attaining our commitment to biological diversity issues uh, and protection is already undermined and it is supposed those impacts to the powers that be in a manner that you know treats such kind of impacts as significant uh, impacts to conservation but also to support the evaluation of the effectiveness of impact mitigation measures you must be aware that already along the SGR, we have got lots of reports and the, you know, the proponents have touted how they have been very responsible, putting in place some of the measures to mitigate the impacts like you know, underpasses, uh, corridors, and other you know, uh, opportunities to allow wildlife to move freely. However, putting them in place is not sufficient. Ensuring that they are usable is the most important. That's not the case at the moment. Uh, and other publications uh, even from Save the Elephants have actually pointed to some of those challenges that need to be addressed, and so far they haven't been attended to. And finally, supporting cumulative environmental assessment and, uh, and transportation planning. Uh, a one-off incident identified really doesn't give much story, but if we have got cumulative trends that we can identify, then it adds more to the discourse and ensures that in a period, within a period of time we are able to incorporate this, but also it can help us reevaluate our approach to environmental impact assessment, for instance, to ensure we really speak to the right people, we speak to the right issues, and we the right methodologies. At the moment, it's more, gener uh, it's more generative, and we have a or rather generic, sorry, and you have a situation where data seems to be mirroring each, each other, the recommendations are the same, uh, the implementation is always skewed and having challenges. So how do we ensure that this kind of results really key into those kind of processes to ensure there's much more accountability? So in this study, we actually took this sometime back in 2018-2019. Uh, and of course, as you know, sometimes in publications, they take a lot of time during the review process. And with the pandemic, we kind of lost some ground there. But we actually did a lot of work in terms of reviewing relevant open access published papers, uh, government documents, policy papers, private sector reports, documents and strategies, as well as mostly media reports. As I mentioned, this is a new phenomenon in the country. We haven't had much publication other than some of the official documents, but a lot of it is really captured in the media reports uh, across the country, which gladly I learned that uh, CAK and its individual members have actually contributed in terms of offering media interviews, providing snippets of their you know, uh, small-scale research to ensure that this information uh, reaches the public. 
Beyond that, we went out to the field for a period of time. 15 interviews with a total of 54 participants from different sectors, including corridor institutions, county governments, conservation and research and development organizations, community groups across that entire stretch from Mombasa all the way to Narok. And then, of course, the data analysis had to take the scientific approach. So because it was basically qualitative data from interviews with individuals on their perceptions, we used a software called Qualitative Data Analysis Minor, uh, which enabled us to do a bit of coding and identify a, a key dominant themes that then help us to come up with some of the issues that we that, uh, our participants were concerned about. And of course, use of uh, GIS as usual to try and map out where some of these things are happening to help support uh, you know, focusing interventions. Uh, so this one is just showing how we moved across the entire section from Mombasa, talking to different people and visiting different SGR stations across uh, different counties all the way uh, up to Nairobi, and then of course finished up with Narok uh, up here. During that period, we also went up to Isiolo uh, up in the north, but because this was only targeting SGR, so the views and perceptions around Lapset in Isiolo have been omitted, but they are captured in different other documents, particularly the one on the public participation uh, in the environmental impact assessment processes for the Lapset and the SGR, which is coming out uh, in due course. So out of these meetings and, and you know, the analysis, we came up with the, our results, which is very brief, and I think some of you will already identify with some of this. We identified three main issues that emerged, particularly insofar as ecosystem uh, you know, integrity is concerned. And the most dominant that everybody was able to identify immediately is the degradation. And this is because the most obvious, whenever you walk around, you see things not in the shape that they should. You are able to identify that. So these are mainly issues that decreased the health uh, or the ecological integrity of these ecosystems through things like disturbance, contamination, and disruption of natural processes, which everybody was able to identify. So things like change in hydrology. In places like Tuala, as well as in, in, in Voi, we had instances where in, terms, in times of heavy rain, uh, because water, uh, or rather uh, runoff, as well as rivers have been uh, channeled to go through the, some of the underpasses, or they have been uh, reorganized to use some of the, uh, you know, areas, there's a lot of overflow, and this results in heavy erosion that affects most of, mostly people downstream or in the downward areas below uh, uh, when, when, it is an, when it is within a hilly area. So we had lots of communities in Voi complain about that. Communities in Twala or in, 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 in Narok mainly complain about the same. And then, of course, Twala, sorry, Twala behind Nairobi National Park, so that's in Kajiado, also had similar issues. And I think some of you might have driven across that region. You'll see that a river in Pakashi had got some areas that had been blocked completely or silted to the water was stagnant, it wasn't flowing at all. Unfortunately, our latest visit showed that some of those were never cleared. So technically, we've lost some of the major streams that really pastoralists are depending on in those areas. But if we leave that from the ecological perspective, those are very critical insofar as wetlands and, uh, and water provision for vegetation is concerned. And those have been lost as a result of the construction and lack of accountability. I think last week we had uh, the, the governor of uh, Taita Taveta uh, on news complaining about some of these uh, downward stream uh, erosions, and that means it still persists to date, and that needs sort of you know addressing because it might become another biggest ecological uh, disaster in that region. Down in, uh, in, in uh, Kitengela again, on the, the other picture, you see that that river, part of a... Uh, at the river has been totally cut off. And so on both sides of the SGR, we have got things that, that look like small dams, and yet it was supposed to be a connected river. So that's a big issue because one of the things that has happened is it has become a major breeding zone for mosquitoes. Most wildlife have now been you know, uh, excluded because it has been converted into a major route that people are now using and wildlife can no longer go there to access that water. But the most important is that natural flow of the river has been cut off and converted into a, a solid ground for movement of people and for monitoring the SGR, uh, the SGR sections and defenses, which is not what it was intended for. The other bit under uh, deg degradation is the issues of pollution, uh, particularly from road dust. If you see during construction, this used to happen a lot. 
and of course now as the road that uh, runs along the SGR for monitoring is there, I mean for maintenance is purely, you know, uh, it's, it's just an all weather road. Whenever they drive there, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen them, there's a lot of over speeding or rather a lot of dust emerging from there because of the speed of the vehicles and that dust still finds a place somewhere either on the leaves of plants or on communities and that's still a major issue. Issues of noise, you will, re you will learn Within Nairobi National Park, there were attempts to try and address that by putting noise insulators, but of course in other areas that are not within the park, we still have noise going on, and you are all aware that wildlife within these areas are not confined within the park, they move out into the community areas, and therefore that impact is still felt outside those areas. Down in Voi, we also had similar sentiments from the, uh, you know, different officials that we interviewed in terms of how the noise is really, you know, affecting uh, activities down there. Water sources that have been polluted with pa dust particles. This is one we got from a Twala area. That is purely brown. And like, you know, interestingly, communities are uh, uh, using this water for their domestic purposes. So like the one I'm pointing, pointing in there is water that was uh, collected in the morning and left to decant uh, so that in the afternoon they are able to carry it home and use for their drinking pretty much a problem, but also that open pit is a danger, not just to society, but also to animals. Sometimes they might get stuck there when they are looking for water, maybe at night or whatever it is, but also <clears throat> it's a natural barrier to the movement of wildlife. If at all that was a cause, it can no longer work. So this is just behind the Nairobi National Park, which is a major concern as well. The other bit is the emergence of invasive plant species across different sessions, and this is from Savo again. Uh, within Nairobi National Park, we wanted to do a survey to see how they are linked to the SGR construction and other infrastructure. We haven't done that, but lots of conversation has gone on in so far as how these uh, new plant species are spreading all over the space because of disturbance. And because the construction of the SGR, like other infrastructure, really constitutes uh, disturbance, it means that the soil structure is changed and so species emerge, but also the soil that was brought in for the embankments were brought in with new, you know, either seeds or other plants that were not native to this region. And it has happened now that this entire section along the SGR, if you drive uh, past Mchichu and Day, once you are within the park, you'll see for yourself a lot of tobacco plants all over the, uh, the embankments of the SGR. Sometime back in December, they tried burning them, which is another an ecological way of handling it. And I think you're familiar with what happened to the park as a result of that fire spillover. So it's another challenge for us as conservationists in so far, in so far as management of that invasive species is concerned. And then last week I drove through uh, area, areas in day where the soil for uh, the SGR construction was uh, taken in a place called Mangelete, and it was disastrous. The entire valley is packed with the, uh, with the invasive plant species, the tobacco plant. And I spoke with the KWS team, and there are, it's, it's kind of creeping into the park already. So we have another challenge in our hands to handle, insofar as uh, you know the, the negative impacts of the SGR construction and operation is concerned. Quickly, the second uh, dominant theme that emerged is the issues of fragmentation, and of course, these were not very obvious to the communities because uh, they kind of just impacted on wildlife within areas, insofar as their movement is concerned. So the creation of barriers to the movement of wildlife to utilize some of those sections was quite obvious. Uh, disruption of animal behavior. Now this, we haven't observed it so much of late, but during that period, uh, what we saw was that elephants, for instance, were becoming more and more aggressive. Uh, but also we saw a bit of evasive behavior by some of the wildlife that never bothered with people passing through. Whenever they had some movement or some sound, you'd see them take off which is already a major challenge because they're already associating some of those noise with the threats to their survival within that landscape. Uh, but also destruction of part of the habitats, leaving other areas intact, in the sense that where the SGR has passed at the moment, you are all aware it's been fenced. Other than creating a barrier with the embankment itself, the fences have also created additional barrier that animals have to navigate through to get to other opening areas to utilize the entire landscape. Sometimes they are unavoidable, but I think in terms of their placement and in terms of their design, there needed to have been a bit of consultation to ensure that they were wildlife friendly and also to ensure that the connectivity is never uh, interrupted. The other bit that I mentioned initially about direct mortality of animals, uh, not so much with the SGR at the moment, it's gone down because of the fencing, but you will recall with the old meter gauge, gauge railway, we used to have some 
And so one of the successful mitigation measures has been the erection of the uh, electrified fence along the entire SGR, and that keeps away animals. However, in Ketengela, uh, we learned that some of the smaller animals are still able to cross, and they find themselves on the wrong side of the tracks, and they have been run over quite minimal. But on the contrary, the, par the parallel roads that run through uh, the SGR, particularly in Savo, have seen a lot of animals killed. And the, in one of the papers that we are working on now is looking specifically at the road kills within the Savo conservation area and how that is impacting on wildlife, uh, uh, wildlife distribution and utilization of that ecosystem. So that will be another addition to just try and expand on some of this data that was missed out. <clears throat> so this results in the wildlife avoiding some of these areas and finding new habitats. Unfortunately, these new habitats tend to be areas of human occupation where they also carry out farming. And so we've had cases of human wildlife conflicts increasing around Savo, for instance, uh, around Nairobi National Park with the livestock uh, you know, uh, attacks increasing as some of the lions I was made to understand move down south away from the SGR. And that really is a implication is we are going to lose some of these animals in conflict, un unintended though. And of course, uh, this map here uh, from Save the Elephants is a clear indication of what is happening on the ground. Uh, having mapped some of the movements, or I mean, some of the corridors and collared, movement of collared elephants with the intention of establishing how they utilize some of those underpasses. Very interesting. Actually, the evidence is quite nice because it shows they were actually utilizing those underpasses. However, on the right side of your screen, again, you see people have really invaded those underpasses. Top shows livestock, uh, those are comments, eh? walking through the same underpass into the Savo Conservation, uh, into the Savo National Park. And that means wildlife have already been excluded from there. Uh, the picture below it shows a gentleman burning charcoal within that space between the SGR and the Mombasa Nairobi Highway. And it's just a few meters from, the, uh, from, from one of the corridors. And of course, when you've driven through that section after Voi going towards the uh, Buchuma Gate, You've seen a lot of construction along that entire section. Some of the corridors have now been blocked completely because they can no longer be used wildlife, just to ensure that wildlife don't go into these illegal community settlements. These are big challenges that might require political intervention, but it's good that we highlight them and realize that even though the intention was good, but the implication or the side effects that were never thought through have actually come to haunt the entire process and there's need for intervention. Uh, so I talked about the modification of wildlife behavior. They become more aggressive. So that's a picture of an elephant that was taken, uh, that was locked between the, uh, the SGR fence and the SGR embankment. And of course, a lot of fright and a you know, uh, threat being seen there. So other than that, when such an animal gets out, of course, it automatically sees people as a threat. And that changes their behavior and they become more and more uh, you know, hostile towards people. As I've talked about the illegal settlements blocking those areas. Now, the last bit that was quite uh, you know, hidden to many people because of its long-term nature is the ecosystem destruction. Now, this is a case where the activities result in total elimination of certain habitat types and their replacement with non-natural uses or with specialized semi-natural habitats. So what are we talking about? Consider a situation where the entire wetland has been in a settlement place there. That's a destruction, or an entire section of a forest cleared and people, you know, start farming there. That's a destruction. However, these were not directly linked to the SGR activities, but they were thought that as a result of the SGR and other infrastructure being successfully installed in these locations, it offered an incentive for more people to move in to occupy those spaces. We've just given an example of population settling there. If you look at the, the picture, an entire settlement uh, just right on the corridor. So this was taken by elephant steel, uh, but also recently we've seen a situation where communities uh, in areas that never used to be heavily settled have now, have, have now developed uh, you know, proper settlements, like in Suswa, where there's an emergence of real estate development uh, that is picking up because of the SGR just across. Uh, down in uh, Maimahiu, there's a lot of expansion going on, but also around the, 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 uh, the Naivasha inland port, roads have been constructed and people are moving in in droves to occupy those spaces. So those were areas that were originally left to work for wildlife, and you realize they are no longer going to be useful for wildlife anymore, not because of the SGR in infrastructure, but because of the incentive and the conditions uh, created by some of this infrastructure that is offering opportunities for businesses 
and people to settle in and start utilizing them for economic purposes. Uh, but also some of the, you know, what we observed was that as communities now see opportunities from the SGR, uh, particularly the, uh, the pastoralists, we saw a situation where they felt they needed to increase their livestock because they thought it would be easier to transport livestock to markets. Uh, and that has got an implication in, in so far as ecosystem degradation and the destruction entire ecosystem is concerned. And these were all issues that we observed on the ground and also had uh, views from people. And this did not even spare government institutions. I think those of you who have had a chat with the KWS team will tell you some of the issues they have gone through. We had a specific conversation with the KEFRI team in Kibwezi. And interestingly, some of the forests where they were running their experiments and projects had been cleared with a promise of being resettled elsewhere or being offered another for a place elsewhere that uh, the SGR uh, proponents would actually participate in rehabilitation. That never happened up to now. The SGR is operational, but they have lost an entire forest and there's nothing to replace it with. And so those are some of the dilemmas that really emerge as we focus mainly on the ecosystems, I mean, on the development as opposed to impacts or other interaction with the ecosystems. In conclusion, therefore, our results show that indeed the SDR affected key ecosystems in the country, and we know they are synchrony between impact mitigation, construction, and operation. There's a bit of similarity there, but also the stakeholder views. Some of these, what we've actually come to, we tend to ignore local communities and stakeholders and favor what we call the experts when we're making some of these decisions. But you forget about uh, the issues of indigenous knowledge, experiential kind of you know, awareness, these people have lived in these ecosystems for long. They know what is workable and what's not workable. They know where some of these things are, are emerging and where they can survive. And so speaking to them could have offered better options as opposed to imposing what they were calling expert views on local communities. It therefore presents a conflicting view of project developers and would be project uh, beneficiaries and exposes the weaknesses with the environmental safeguards that should be considered in ecological sensitive project designs and implementation process, we also learned that, uh, you know, environmental impact assessments were conducted, and there are records to show that they were done. There are documents to show that they were done, and the reports to show that they were done. The question then is, why do we still have these impacts uh, being identified several years after the SGR uh, construction going on, as well as the implementation? Of course, it, it, it begs the question as to the process of conducting the uh, environmental impact assessment, which I think most of us in this forum have actually raised an issue about that. <clears throat> it is therefore time to rethink that and ask hard questions as to how is it organized, who are the participants, how facilitates this, and the entire you know, uh, layout of that process needs to be questioned and made more responsible and more, uh, you know, uh, in a manner that offers the intended safeguards to the environment and social systems. With that in mind, we therefore recommend that some of the, uh, the project proponents really develop sustainable and ecologically sensitive measures to mitigate these impacts. The challenge with this at the moment, although we've recommended, is that you know, phase one of the SDR is gone, phase two is completed, phase three is in limbo. So we are now left to live with impacts and the responsibility is thrown back to us as people in conservation to find ways to address this uh, in, in retrospect. We cannot move the SGR and we cannot change the stations from where they are. So how then do we go about ensuring that environment remains sustainable, but the SGR still performs its function? So those are some of the issues we are asking through and in our subsequent uh, publications, we'll be coming up with more focused and more practical solutions to some of the, uh, you know, uh, 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 scientifically based uh, impacts that we will have identified either on water, on the ecosystems and also on the social systems. So with that in mind, therefore, I think we, I will conclude at that point. And of course, much more detailed analysis and account of some of this material is available in the paper. If you get your time, please do read through and you know, give us your views. I already mentioned the partners involved in this project and uh, feel free to get in touch with us at your convenience. Thank you so much, Steve, and uh, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias, uh, for that uh, presentation, uh, which is quite uh, elaborate. And uh, I have also been following the charts um, online. Uh, it's a very interesting house that you're projecting there. <laughs> I'm wondering. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to stop sharing, but I've lost 
one. Okay, no problem, no problem. Uh, we'll uh, wait for so you. Uh, that, that, yeah. Yes, it's okay. Uh, I think at some point, uh, at some point, uh, there were some presenters that found you speaking very fast, but I hope they were able to, there was actually one who said you speak slowly, uh, but you are able to, I hope that, that that person who requested was able to follow. Um, and so you've highlighted quite a number of things, and I like the way you concluded uh, by saying that, yes, there is an impact that SGR has actually caused on the ecosystem. And uh, we need to figure out uh, how some of those things, are, how some of those impacts uh, that you've uh, duly noted uh, can be addressed. And uh, how then the lessons that we've learned from uh, your presentation can also be used in terms of uh, moving forward as a way of, um, uh, you know, making sure that uh, the concerns of the local indigenous people on the ground are taken on board and that there is a, a wider consultation and participation, particularly by the people who are going to be affected by these infrastructure uh, developments. Uh, I have also seen uh, quite a lot of comments uh, on the chat box, and I requested the participants as much as possible to take their questions onto the Q and answer session. It would be easier for the panelists to see your questions there. Uh, but based on the presentation, I would like to open the floor now to uh, to a reaction um, uh, on, on the presentation. Uh, and I've also seen uh, there are two questions that have actually been sent by Diana. Uh, allow me, Tobias, to read them so that at least you can prepare. Diana is asking, um, she's actually thanking you for the wonderful presentation. And she's asking, what are the next steps after doing this study? Will you share the recommendations? and share with the respective government institutions. That's question number one from Diana. Question number two from Diana is, how should civil society be engaged in dissemination of the study findings? Yeah, so those are two important questions. One is asking, are you going to share the recommendations and how do you um, engage with the relevant government institutions? And then how do we disseminate uh, the findings? Uh, so as you prepare for that, I would like to open the session now to plenary uh, where we can react to that as uh, Tobias uh, prepares for that response. So if you have a question, just raise up your hand. Uh, we will be able to see it and we'll give you an opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, so maybe I give Tobias an opportunity to address those two questions by Diana. And then now uh, by show of hands, if you can raise your hands, then I will be able to uh, to give at least the first three people to ask uh, questions, and then Tobias responds to that. Then we go to the next set of questions. So over to you, Tobias, uh, for those two questions that have been asked by Diana. Thanks so much, Steve, and uh, thank you so much, Diana. Uh, first, I would like to apologize. Sometimes when I speak, I get into what I call character, and <laughs> the speed simply shoots, and sometimes it's good that somebody noticed and brought that back that, but unfortunately, uh, the presentation is done, so I'm sorry, we might still get in touch. Uh, to answer Diana's questions about uh, the next steps, uh, first of all, like I mentioned, this was more or less a reconnaissance study just to lay the, the foundation and to set you know, our research agenda straight. And uh, for those of you who might have been within the networks in 20... We had a workshop uh, in April of 2019 that brought on board all the stakeholders to share with them some of these prelim preliminary findings in order to guide how we are going to conduct the research in the project going forward. And what we've done, number one, is to ensure that our research is now geared towards the needs of the would-be beneficiaries. In this case, we have got the Kenha team that we work with uh, regularly. We share our, our findings with them and also share different forums. Number two is the Kenya Railways Corporation that have also had a chance to look at this paper and they are happy that we actually highlighted what they felt needed to be done. Number three, the management authority uh, with whom we are in constant conversation with different uh, uh, you know, members of their team. Uh, number four is the Environment Institute of Kenya that we are also engaging with and looking towards making sure that environmental and social impact assessments are actually done in a manner that speaks to the reality of what they are supposed to achieve. So that way then we are able to ensure that our recommendations find a home where they can be implemented 
for the benefit of both the country uh, and, and its nature. But beyond that, some of the research that now we are conducting that are more based on empirical data are also still going to find a home within the same institution making this more relevant at the top levels of government. And I think uh, if Lucy might... But in a nutshell, what we are doing is to engage the top level government officials and the international institutions under the auspice of the United Nations Environment Program. So Lucy is currently spearheading what's called the high level interministerial dialogue to try and assimilate some of this information into their planning. As you are aware, we, have a, we are in a situation where planning in this country is done in silos. The Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Environment, Wildlife, Forestry, each one of them, infrastructure, each one of them is doing their own thing without minding the impacts of their activities on the other ministries. So, to ensure that they all understand that their activities have got that cross-cutting impact, and that can only be done if it is understood at that top level of decision making. Uh, beyond that, at the end of it, we hope that our findings will find a uh, place in form of policy recommendations. And this will still target the same government institutions. And we are not going to do this in isolation as a research, in, uh, research uh, collab uh, collaborative forum, but we want to do this in collaboration with the target institutions in, to ensure that the wording, the language, the content is relevant to what they need to do. So that should be our next steps. And of course, I would like to mention that the project comes to an end. Uh, to the yeah. And so this year is basically dedicated towards issues of dissemination advocacy, collaboration, and ensuring that at the end of the project, whatever we found out doesn't stay in the papers on, the, on, on journals, but it finds its way where it is most needed, and that's within the government institutions. And that ties to the second question, which is uh, how can the civil society be engaged? Number one is through platforms like this one. When we are able to talk to you and you are able to share in our concerns, we've already hit home because we all speak the same language. The only challenge that I will, I've always spoken about is a uh, of pastors talking about uh, how people are sinning out there and how people are being immoral out there, I don't think there's any impact because the pastors already know the reason for sinning and the reason for being immoral, but they're not speaking to the immorals, asking them why are they immoral. So what then we are uh, speaking through in collaboration with other partners is to ensure that it doesn't become a congregation of people who are already converted. We already know the impact. So how do we bring on board people who do not know the impact? And that is beyond the CAK uh, you know, platform. And I think Sheila mentioned that it's not just for those involved in conservation, but also those whose activities really impact conservation need to be brought on board so that they hear what you are saying and they tell us why they do things the way they do. In one of the forums in 2019, uh, early 2019, uh, the infrastructure institutions were very candid with us. They said they know how to design roads and build roads. They don't know how to protect the environment and conserve wildlife and conserve wildlife, but we don't know how to design roads and build those roads. So how do we match the two? Their call was that they really wish they could do that, but they don't have the data. The conservation institutions have got this very beautiful data, but they share it amongst themselves. So we need to go beyond that boundary and ensure that we cross land from each, from each other to make sure that everything is sustainable. So the civil society organizations have got a role to play insofar as breaking those barriers and ensuring that people speak across different professions and not speaking in silos of their comfort zones and their uh, you know, equal uh, peers and partners. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tobias. I can see there are two, uh, actually three participants that had um, requested to speak. Their hands were, were up and I'll pre present the order. I'll give uh, Lori the opportunity first, uh, followed by Paul on Google, and then after Paul, uh, we'll have Joan um, ask. So over to you, Lori. Um, hi, I actually didn't request to speak so much as I just put, put forth a question. Um, okay. I'm just wondering, you know, is there any indication of any willingness on the part of anyone who can do anything to try to mitigate the things that have already happened? Because with the SGR, the damage, the damages are incredibly bad, obviously, and something needs to be done to change that. You know, going forward with new developments, yes, they need to be done better in the future, but right now we've got some really serious problems. Tobias, do you know if there's anyone that's really gonna listen to this? 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, could we could we take the round of three questions? Then you can answer them, Tobias. Once we are done. Right. Uh, right. Yes. Then. The next one is uh, Paul. Paul, you can unmute yourself to speak. Yeah, uh, you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, uh, Tobias for the good presentation. I have shared with you about three issues on the chat message, but just to reiterate, the presentation is full of, uh, you know, distress, like uh, things are happening which we cannot have control over. And it makes me feel like is development really a good thing? Because when we build roads, we build railway lines, and then we end up destroying biodiversity, we destroy social infrastructure, we end up like uh, the cost of the construction becomes very high in terms of uh, economic and uh, even social cost. And it makes me wonder, is it that uh, as uh, people in development, we are not visionary. Because for example, I've seen when roads come, trees are cut down, built some buildings are pulled down, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when we look at uh, the social impact assessment reports or environmental impact assessment reports, they talk mainly of mitigation and not prevention. It's like we are always, uh, uh, bent on going on with development at whatever cost. But is it turning out to be development? The paper is full of, um, you know, things which have happened which are not good. See if when these things were happening, most of us who are participating in this, even including the authors, it's like they were not there. And uh, it is really uh, distressing to people like me in terms of uh, loss of uh, biodiversity, loss of uh, landscapes, and et cetera, et cetera. But in a nutshell, I think what is important now is how do we forestall this kind of incidences which we are talking about? And secondly, how do we make good areas where problems have occurred, areas where there are losses which have occurred, and I hope this ties to what the lady, the first uh, commentator, also raised. So what, what is the next steps in terms of ensuring that we readdress some of these issues which we have highlighted in this presentation? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Joan? Hi, thank you very much. Um, so my name is uh, Joan Seek, and thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to present some viewpoints. I am a lawyer from New York, and uh, Steve, as you know, you and I were very young, you know, in the early days of uh, conservation, 1995 and onwards. Now, it, um, so I fought the Jemmy Bora housing project in Asinia. It was a test case for the Environmental Management Coordination Act of the National Environment Management Authority, which, as we all know, is a, is a complete abortion. That my, my take on things, Steve, in this panel and this forum is that, um, you know, from, from that time in 2006, where EMCA was officially declared aborted, I mean, it was, a, it was st it's a stillborn piece of legislation and has to be reviewed, it has to be audited. Um, there's a lot of stuff going in the courts. My deepest feeling, Steve, is that we've got to go back to the judiciary. You have to go back. I know. I know. Back in the 19, 1990s, two thousand, there was I led you were all kinds of institutions to look at uh, the jurisprudence of uh, the complexity of environmental laws of this country. Kenya enjoys in this region the most complex um, conservation laws. I mean, beginning with uh, the Lands Act, the Constitution, EMCA, Wildlife Policy Act. They have to be effective. They have to be enforced. Uh, the, 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 the legal system, the judiciary, two institutions that really have to be challenged, you know, to create better benchmarks. We've got an election coming up in Kenya. You've got a new government now in the United States. The reason why I'm attending this session today, Steve, is tomorrow. I'm on a webinar with uh, Corporate Council for Africa, which is um, based in Washington, D.C. Now, on their agenda is infrastructure, roads, <laughs> power, 
you know, every time I go to these, you know, U.S. investment forums, you know, the, the American Chamber forums, the, uh, you know, the private sector forums on, on investment in Kenya, the IMF forums, you know, it's only talk about um, infrastructure and economic uh, sectors. There is no talk about the env environment and certainly no talk about uh, conservation and certainly no talk about wildlife, uh, especially because I think the incomprehension in Washington of what exactly is going on in East Africa in the conservation sector, kind of remote. Um, my, 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 my big, 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 big suggestion, uh, hope for this, for, for Kenya, for this region, um, number one is to reform the judiciary and, and, and really to get better law out and to get better enforcement out um, the legal route. Um, I know a lot, of con a lot of conservation groups are taking the legal route. I know we did in 206 with the Jimmy Bora issue. You were very much a part of that. You were very much part of the SBR uh, legal challenge. The results in the courts are disastrous. I think you've got to go now. Uh, Kenya is signatory to the multilateral jurisdictions. You, you got to go to international jurisdictional forums and keep pushing perhaps the UN, for perhaps the, the Hague. I think some of the stuff going on now on the ground is definitely criminal uh, environmental uh, degradation. So, um, so I think I think the judiciary. I, we need a good win. We need a good enforceable win on uh, on, on infrastructure. Um, we've got the laws. Steve. Everyone can tell you we've got. The, we need we have loads of laws in place. They have to work. They they just have to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, Lori, and Joan, uh, for those uh, questions and insights. I just want to share something a little bit on the law. Uh, the reason why we held the first um, uh, forum on um, environmental public litigation was precisely for the reason of preparing civil society uh, in terms of uh, what to expect in court when you, go to, when you move to court and also how you build your case and how you present your evidence in court so that we can access justice through the court. And I think uh, if we were to look back, uh, Lori, uh, Joanne, from what you just explained about the cases that have gone to court uh, based on uh, infrastructure development in wildlife conservation area, you will find that uh, none of those cases have actually given us the intended results. And the reason why we held that webinar is to be able to give us insight and prepare us so that when we are accessing the courts, uh, how do we address the matters in the court? And uh, at times we lose cases and we don't even appeal and we don't move to the higher court even to develop what we call jurisprudence uh, that lawyers also can uh, make. So I think the biggest undoing for us in the environment and wildlife sector, and particularly in the conservation of natural resources in this country in relation to access to justice, is we don't take cases to court and we don't prepare cases very well. So when you go to the judiciary and tell them, oh, there was this matter that was ruled like this, they look at it and they tell you, uh, you know, uh, you did not do adequate preparation in terms of, um, you know, coming with, um, with your proper ask to the court in relation to accessing the justice and the decision. And some of the decisions that have been made also can be challenged and over time, by civil society moving to court, we've actually seen MCA Act being diluted each and every time because the government looks at it where MCA is very strong and goes on and makes amendments and now excludes some of those projects from EIA and SIA reports. Then the other area where a civil society, I think we need to be watchful and uh, ensure that we, we have more insight is actually on the sections in the environmental impact assessment and the environmental social impact reports, particularly on the environmental management plans, because on those reports is where the proponent details how they are going to mitigate some of the issues they have already identified in the management report. And unfortunately, uh, civil society has no mechanisms even to hold the proponent of the project accountable. And there is no mechanism even just to follow up and ensure that environmental management plan within the environmental impact report itself is actually addressed. I can see Paul's hand and Joanne's hand is up because uh, I'd wanted to ask um, Tobias and Lucy to respond to these questions. But let me just go back to Paul 
uh, and uh, see what Paul has to ask. Then John, and then after those two speak, then I would uh, ask uh, Tobias to respond to those uh, uh, questions, and then also Lucy. So Paul, do you want to add something, or you forgot to bring down your hand? You can unmute yourself, Paul. Yes, Actually, Paul, my hand was already down, but the machine. Ah, okay. Yes. All right. Hello? It's down. Yes. My hand okay, is so down. down. Yeah. All right. Joan, do you want to add something? Yeah. What's your phone number? Listen, Steve, the issue is this. The, you know, you, you've got to strengthen conservation advocacy. You know, you and I start in Friends of Nairobi National Park. Friends. What does that mean? It's a volunteer structure going on now 25, almost 30 years later, we're volunteers against what? Cement companies, China, hotel companies, uh, you name it. You know, conservation advocacy. Uh, wh what do you mean we don't go to court? What do you mean we don't appeal? Judgments can attach your house when you lose. What the heck? Steve, you know, the inequities, the unfairness in the courts is, is, is bizarre. You know, phone up is a bunch of volunteers, volunteers. And we've got, and, and for decades, we've been scratching our pockets to pay the rent, to pay the phone, to pay the this, pay registration, pay that. Who the, how the heck do you get into court? You know, the, 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 the you know, who are you defending by, by, you're not, the giraffe, does the giraffe pay you? Okay, so you go for the community. Do you think the community can put, put the, some, some legal fees into your pocket so you can move in court? You need a legal, you need a conservation advocacy, legal defense on urgently. So you can empower uh, conservation advocacy and, and, and fight fairly in the court with lawyers, you know, with, 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 with some sort of strength behind you. Because right now, it's, you know, you know what happened in Jimmy Bora. How could we fight? How could we fight government? How, how, how could we fight the Strong Foundation, which was funding the whole King Kabuto, billions and billions in the infrastructure? You're a volunteer. Think about yeah. it. It's, you I know, hear you. Uh, I mean, we hope we'll get an action. Yeah, we hope we'll get an action by the end of uh, this webinar. So over to you, Tobias. Uh, okay. And then Lucy. Yeah. No, thank you so much, John. I like I like the enthusiasm and the spirit. I mean, these are some of the things that we've really thought through. And I mentioned at, at the beginning of my talk that uh, matters, infrastructure, and conservation. Mm -hmm are actually not new across the world, but for us in many parts of Africa, we are just starting to do some research on that. So most of the recommendations have been pegged on what is happening in Canada, Australia, North America, and we are just building on the road ecology work that they have done for years and years. The biggest problem we have now is without data and what we call the evidence, we really don't have a case because all that is seen there is just observations and which most of the time we found ourselves being dismissed for not having robust a claim or robust evidence towards our claim. So I think first of all, you know, the DCP project has actually offered a foundation on what such kind of arguments can really be based to ensure that going forward, we build on a case that's already based on evidence. Uh, but also beyond that, at, at the moment within the DCP project, we are still very few and we are, uh, we are actually building on the network of like-minded minded partners to ensure that uh, we expand on what we are doing with the little resources we have, but also to ensure that we have all this critical mass of researchers, uh, or what I call Kenyans, who are able to undertake this piece of work and bring out the evidence more strongly in a manner that can convince the government that it's not the normal way that they always view the civil society as anti-development. Whenever we start claiming that something is not good, they challenge us to provide our evidence, and in most cases, uh, or in some cases, we've been found flat-footed. So I think this is a good opportunity to evidence. Unfortunately for Paul, uh, most of the positive impacts that might arise from infrastructure actually is pegged on the economic development. We don't have not come across positive benefits of roads to a forest or to an elephant or to an animal. So we are kind of constrained in this corner where our research really tries to bring out what are the impacts and they happen to be the negative impacts because most of the positive really <coughs> are pegged on the side of economic development and therefore we are locked in this distress corner for quite some time until we find a solution uh, and that does not mean that uh, there are no good ones 
There are ways that have been used in other setups to try and address that as an alternative to environmental and social impact assessment. A number of you might have come across what's called the mitigation hierarchy, for instance, which is doing very well with the likes of IFC, uh, with the private investors, particularly the petroleum industry and mining, who are funded. They are supposed to undertake a more robust uh, assessment based on the mitigation hierarchy uh, framework that ensures that they become as responsible and participatory as possible. And that takes care of what uh, Paul mentioned. Is there a way to avoid some of these things before they happen? It then looks into matters of avoidance and then mitigating and changing, you know, addressing some of all these things before you finally decide that we have to build. Uh, you will be familiar with the discussions around the Nairobi National Park when those options were given. And I think in one of the webinars, one of the participants in those meetings mentioned that the entire discourse was based on economics and the costs that I think Paul also alluded to. And see for us as people in the road infrastructure construction, if we incorporate all these your claims about environment, about natural resources, about rivers and what have you. So if they can easily dismiss us because they can say they are going to spend $10 per kilometer on a road, and if you throw in environmental uh, you know, costs there, we really can't tell them how much we are going to lose as a result of one loss of a tree that is standing. And so one of the things we do within the DCP is also to ensure that uh, we undertake what's called uh, natural capital assessment, trying to cost some of these ecosystem services in a manner that speaks to what they call the economic shape because we don't have enough expertise for that, but it is something that we are also calling about, uh, calling upon the uh, the forum to see how those can also be taken. Provide what I would call counterclaims as to the economic costs and environmental costs that are that can be valued and taken into account. Uh, insofar as the last question by Joan, or rather observation by Joan, is concerned, I think that's very interesting. Uh, one of the things we observed when we went through this process, we also looked at the current, uh, you know, environmental management, uh, uh, the MCA, yeah? as well as the NEMA legislations, and there was a very striking observation. It's quite elaborate. It's quite good, and it's done very well. Just like every other policy that is coming out of Kenya, I think you've always been told that Kenya is very good at, you know, developing robust and very interesting and nicely worded policies a missing link. The implementation is where the problem is. The way it is at the moment, uh, you know, the EIA process really gives a lot of weight and leeway to the project proponents, who appoints his consultant, who is responsible or rather responds to him, he pays that consultant, and NEMA is supposed to provide that oversight. We all agree that has not been happening. So one of the proposals we are trying to look at is how do we make the uh, EIA process more robust, how do we improve on it? And one of the suggestions we are working on now with the e, with is to ensure that we train more people on other alternatives like the mitigation hierarchy and start to push for mainstreaming of some of those to ensure that the government then recognizes that. The biggest challenge we have, like you all know, is that the same people who are supposed to allow some of these legislations to be made more robust are the same culprits of, you know, taking away the wetlands and constructing buildings there or diverting roads because they don't want them to pass onto their lands and take them onto some private property or other public property that's a forest somewhere. You are in, a, in Karura Forest, amongst so many other things. So to perhaps allude to Paul's suggestion that we seem to be having a lot of distress calls, it's because that is where we are at the moment, at this stage. And we have to go through that distress to come to the reality of what we are facing and come up with more practical solutions and hold our government accountable. Lucy mentioned that we're already working uh, with different government institutions to ensure these things are done. And of course, that's the way to go. Because as an outsider, you can't change what is done within the house. You have to find a way into the house and present your views and challenge some of the existing practices and see how it can be made more robust. So our belief, therefore, is that working with different government institutions might help us address some of these. Unfortunately, some of them have already occurred, like the ones, uh, you know, as Lori mentioned, the impacts are already being seen. They have already happened. We've lost some animals on the roads. They have been killed. So how do we address that? What we are trying to do now is also to, re in retrospect, try to reimagine or rethink some of those mitigation measures. Are the underpasses working? 
if they are not working, how do we improve on them? And that requires long-term monitoring and data to present, to convince somebody. And you're glad that the elephants has done a lot of work on that. We are collaborating with them. Kenya, they are willing to participate in the process. Kenya is on the board, Kenya Railways is on board. And these are the key players whom we can consider the culprits of these activities. And they are, if they are willing to participate, willing to share with us what they don't know and what they know, then I think that's a major step going forward. So we are still at the, what I would call, infancy stages. We are just generating this evidence, but you already have promise in future in terms of engagement with the relevant government institutions. For us at the forum, it's also an opportunity to think outside the box. How do we then engage with them? One thing that I learned during the interviews was that uh, there was a bit of resistance to engage with the conservation sector because they are seen to be anti-development. So how do we shed off that level to ensure that we have got that you know, uh, more responsive and uh, receptive playing field? It is upon us then to see in a manner that ensures that our voices are heard in a, in a way that they feel we are not seeing them as people who are not responsible, people who are ignorant, but people who just didn't have the right information. And you are now giving them that right information to try and take us through. I'll hand over to Lucy briefly before I leave, just to share something she was there to mention about the same process, uh, the same question from Laurie on you know, the willingness to do something. How do we go about that and whether there are ways or things that are being done at the moment? Lucy, please. Uh, all right, thank you, Tobias. And thank you for this very important discussions, which I think we are all feeling the sense of one urgency, but also the sense of frustration. Um, and we really must work at multiple levels to see how we can address what's going on. I completely agree, Joanne, we need to be able to win some cases and some of this data helps us uh, prevent evidence of uh, the impact of this infrastructure. I think we need to also change our laws to have language in other sectors, all our laws, relating to impact on environment and biodiversity are in our wildlife act or in the policies for forestry and water. But how about uh, pushing in the energy policy in the uh, transport uh, act to have language that requires safeguards for wildlife, safeguards for biodiversity. So they are held responsible by their own policies and acts to really provide for these safeguards. Currently, everyone just talks about an EIA and we won't belabor how inadequate that is, but there is no inherent responsibility with these agencies to, to avoid, to minimize, and to ensure there is no biodiversity net loss. So I would say we need to think in Kenya, how can we start caring about that when these acts come for revision, for transport, for energy, are we interested in knowing what they have and what they are missing and ensuring we put in language that provides the safeguards we, we want. I think one of the other things we found in undertaking this project, the technical people, you talk to Kenha, Kura, uh, Kenjen, the technical people are now concerned about these impacts, but they don't have a forum where they talk to each other. And if their DGs in their institutions don't see that as important, then they as the technical engineers cannot voluntarily start talking to their counterparts in the other ministry. So we would like to work with whoever is uh, interested to start bringing the ministries at the highest level possible into the dialogues of discussing the importance of cross-sectoral discussions so that their technical people can be required to consult across the sectors at the planning stage and at the design stage. I agree mitigation is way too expensive and who pays for it? But if we agree that these are measures they must put in place before, and should they not, they will at their own cost pay for the mitigation, those perhaps will become uh, deterrents that make them uh, pay attention. So let's think about the legal, let's think about the technical engagement, but let's also think about the capacity. And so the training we are proposing on mitigation hierarchy for all EIA experts, we are going through the, the body that authorizes EIA experts, to say we can offer the training on mitigation hierarchy so that your EIA experts also understand what they should be looking for beyond just ticking the boxes for their proponent. And um, I believe when those come available and Tobias is behind organizing those with the EIA Institute, um, we will open it up so that others who, the more of us who know what is expected, the easier it is for us to reach the message with more and more people. But my last point also, let me give an example of power lines. In South Africa, 
they have engaged the power company so effectively that in the current arrangements with Kruger National Park, their power company, ESCOM, actually funds the conservation body to monitor the impacts of the power lines, to mitigate the, and, and reverse those impacts and to restore. So what a partnership, that it's the energy company itself, the power company itself, funding the conservation agency to check on them, to ensure that as they monitor the effect of their power lines, they're able to give advice on better designs. They're able to give data on where there's impact so that there can be a redesigning. And that's where we need to get into that. We are sitting here with Kenya Power and telling them they need to fund the mitigation, not only the mitigation actually, the avoidance and the minimization of loss by redesigning their power lines, by placing them in appropriate places. It's being done by ESCOM in South Africa and they're still in business. It's not a loss making company. So we need to get to that level of engagement across with the other sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy and Tobias for that. I would like us to, to get on to the questions that have been asked on the, on the Q&A session. I will um, look at the one asked by Lori. Is there any willingness in the government to try and mitigate any of the many disasters created by SGR, especially around uh, Savo? Uh, Tobias, any response to that? Sorry, I missed that point. Is there any willingness in the government to try and mitigate any of the many disasters created by SGR, especially around Savo? Uh, well, at the moment, I wouldn't say yes or no, because uh, uh, we are just having a conversation about that. It involves redefining some, I mean, re redesigning some of those uh, existing measures and we haven't really got to a point where we've had a conversation on what they can do to change that because of resources. But uh, this, what you've seen is willingness to engage with us and talk about this. So probably when resources become available, there might be some, some uh, you know, things done. But beyond that, I think we are also banking on their willingness to participate and join us to try and leverage on other sources of findings so that we are able to provide uh, that support based on evidence that we'll have collected from the research process. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so that means um, in your research, because uh, you explained that um, some animal movement, uh, the areas where they are moved is completely blocked. Uh, when you engage the, um, the government and the, develop, uh, the developers and the designers, are they giving some hope that uh, in areas where there is a requirement of an underpass, that it's possible actually to construct an underpass to ease the movement of animal or is it just a done area? I think these are the kind of questions that Lori is asking, uh, particularly in areas where you need to open that connectivity. Can the developers design something where they can create underpasses, underpasses to allow animals to move over to the other side? Maybe I can give an update, uh, Tobias. I know um, when some of the impacts of SGR were noted, Save the Elephants was able to provide data based on the telemetry data they've been collecting on elephants to show what would be suitable crossing points. And the Chinese company did redo, because some of the fences they were doing were very weak, elephants were flattening them immediately. So they did redo some components to make effective uh, provisions or barriers so that elephants don't cross in certain places. So that was the developer actually willing to invest uh, for some of that. On the underpasses, there were some established, as you all know, some have not been effective, but what here is the bigger tragedy. In some underpasses in Savo, uh, local people have settled at the underpass. So, so much for that. So it's no longer available actually for wildlife. So now they're involving the Taita Taveta County and KWS to try and uh, resettle the people who now migrated to the underpass as a safe place to put their, their low income housing. So it's a, such a multiplicity of challenges that actually the, the, the county governments and the law enforcers need to work together because you may provide for underpasses, but which are not utilized as underpasses by animals, but which people invade. But number two, it was also noted that where the Chinese put some of the underpasses, it was not in the appropriate location. So again, the importance of data, which they need to use to inform uh, what, what uh, minimization efforts they're they are putting in place. 
but we haven't seen investment yet by government to redo. But there's been a possibility, evidence that you can put the investor uh, responsible for, for redoing what is not done well. But it really should be better planned in advance other than repaired later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for that response. Uh, James um, Mutunga is also asking, uh, is there anything about power generation and transmission infrastructure versus biodiversity safeguards, any best practices? Is this theme captured within your project? I think that uh, question is related to you, Dr. Uh, Tobias. Anything about power generation and transmission infrastructure versus biodiversity safeguard? Are there any best practices? Uh, yeah, there are a number. Uh, I think recently, as, as by early last year, the biodiversity consultants in the UK worked closely uh, with the Vulture project to try and come up with best practices for the wind project, uh, wind projects both in Turkana and up uh, uh, just in, is it in Gong Hills. I think there's one up just above Nairobi. So they, did, they produced a very nice document early last year that really tried to address some of those uh, best practices insofar as the impact assessment is concerned and mitigation. But also I think WWF have also come up with a very uh, elaborate document that looks at uh, the process of environmental and social impact assessment in key biodiversity areas in Northern Kenya around uh, the Turkana oil project. So we kind of don't have Within the country, we don't have much, but beyond, uh, I've not come across one that I can point to, but I'm sure there should be, probably uh, if, if Lucy might have had a chance. But I think uh, the, uh, Nature Kenya is already having some work going on around that, uh, uh, that area as well. And I think a few weeks ago, we had an article from uh, Dr. Matiku that looked broadly about, you know, such kind of a off the ground uh, infrastructure and how they interact with, the, uh, with birds specifically. And so there are a few areas that you can pick lessons from to try and mitigate. Uh, but for us, I think it's not been a very obvious sector because of the fact that it's more or less uh, targeting the bird species as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the on the ground infrastructure that seems to be quite widespread in terms of habitat people and by the and the different species of biodiversity. Okay. Well, thank you, Tobias. Um, uh, there is also a question by Karemi Kimathi. Kimathi, that's about uh, how can a whole river be blocked? Was the river, was the water going to affect the infrastructure integrity of the SGR? I think that's based on your presentation where you had mentioned about uh, a river getting blocked. Yes. No, no, I think that's a very interesting question, and <laughs> I like the way you put it. Uh, in this case, what we observed was that it was blocked to create room for the movement of the equipment. If you saw, if you saw that picture in Kitengela, uh, that entire riverbed was, con was converted onto a road with all the rocks dumped there and cemented to allow for the movement of the, infra uh, of the equipment. And after that, it was never, you know, uh, taken back to its original place. So in other words, uh, the, the, the impact was never removed. It was left there. So what you have today is a road that never existed on the riverbed that is now being used by vehicles on a normal basis. Uh, so basically, it wasn't blocked that was because it was going to affect the, the SGR, but it was blocked to allow the construction. And normally, after construction, like they did with, the, with some of the wetlands down in Kibwezi, was to rehabilitate. But in this case, this was not rehabilitated and it's been left open. Other than that, the other areas where the rivers have been impacted upon is where they have been rechanneled. So what they are calling the rechannelization. So if they are scattered across the landscape and they are small streams, then they try to rechannel them into one stream that then can be guided under one huge underpass. So the implication of that is that the entire river course is changed. And when it gets out on the other end, it's much bigger stream than it was or than it would have been originally. And that has got implications on the downstream communities. Uh, in that case, therefore, it is being rechanneled because it's going to impact on the construction of the SGR, where they are avoiding putting so many underpasses to allow the river streams to grow. So they benefit more by bringing them all into one major stream that can be channeled into one. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tobias. There are two questions that have come from Annabella. And I think they are related to the road uh, towards Marsabit, uh, particularly in relation to 
the underpasses that are much needed in that area to reduce the road kills. And then also the other one is the mini bumps on the road, which I think is not only on that road towards Marsabit, but I think in other areas. Have you undertaken studies on this road also? And uh, what does the data inform in terms of road kills, if you have any information on that? The SGS disaster. <laughs> Good. So thank you so much for that question. Uh, at the moment, we are not doing work on our own. There's somebody speaking? Yeah. Could we unmute ourselves so that uh, we can uh, minimize the background noise? Thank you. Yeah, so at the moment, we are not doing work in the northern part directly ourselves, but we are working with partners uh, up there, which is called the EWASO Infrastructure Information Network, led by uh, Sarah Childs. And what they are doing is exactly to monitor the impacts of that road on biodiversity. Uh, they have got a database on road kills that is really uh, dating back to several years. And we've been sharing some of our experiences with the team down in Savo and around the Athi River area. And what we've learned is that the impacts, particularly on the roads, is quite enormous. They, we receive lots of information every single day on different wildlife species that are run over by vehicles speeding on that road. Uh, but also, well, not, not just wildlife species, but also uh, domestic animals, including dogs and, of course, livestock. Uh, one of the things that has been thought through is how to mitigate that. And uh, I think the, uh, the person who asked the question suggested underpasses. Uh, but given the structure of soil in that region, there's always, you know, uh, thinking about putting an overpass. And so the discussions at the moment is uh, what Sarah Childs is leading with the Ken her team is to try and find a more sustainable solution. And the discussions around overpasses is being muted because that can sustain other than underpasses, the soil is very loose. And so digging any trenches behind beneath that road is going to be disastrous and Kenha might not be willing to do that. We have similar issues on the road from Rumruti going to Maralal, passing through conservancies in Laikipia. And uh, we've got partners around, uh, you know, conservancies there. We're also sending distress calls and uh, worried about the completion of that road and what is going to be the likelihood impact. I think two weeks ago, they also had a case where an elephant or some huge mammal had also been run over on that road. Uh, we haven't really been able to pull this through. All the reasons we get sometimes is the costs and, you know, somebody willing to support. And I will remember. I remember last year, I think Conservation International were trying to work closely with a team in Northern Kenya to fundraise for some of those overpasses, but it didn't go through. So we are still left in limbo. And that takes us back to the willingness bit of it and how we can uh, mobilize resources to do this in a partnership. Uh, the, main, the issue about the road bumps is quite critical because they can really help minimize some of this impact. Uh, along the Voi, uh, Taveta Road, in, in, within the suburb, we have got lots of those, those road bumps, lots of road signs already, warning people about that area being a wildlife crossing area. But that is one of the areas that I still have lots of wildlife kills uh, in my database. So what does that mean, therefore, is that the problem might not just be the road itself and the wildlife itself, but also the road users. So one of the things that we are discussing now with the, uh, with the, with the Kenya Roadkill Working Group is to see how we can go beyond the technical issues of the road, the, bio, the ecological issues of wildlife, to the social issues of people. How do people really respond to some of these things? Do they see the need to protect or rather behave responsibly around wildlife when they are driving? The fact that they can run uh, over vehicle, I mean, a, a wildlife and just, you know, go on with their business as usual speaks a lot about our attitude, about our, our, our mentality, but also about our practices. So one of the things we really want to look at is the awareness both to the drivers and other road users. Their responsibility is critical. Uh, sometime last year, those of, those of us who were in the Facebook team and the WhatsApp group, you saw a picture that was posted of a hyena that had been run over by some gentleman. I don't need to call him gentleman, but, but by some driver. And he stopped and reversed to come and take a video while laughing. And that animal is writhing in, in pain just by the, by the vehicle. Now, that speaks a lot about our, our, our views and attitudes towards the same animals. 
And so, as Lucy mentioned, if we speak to ourselves, those who know the value, and leave out those who think they don't know the value, then you are still going to lose out because you can't police them throughout. There must be a mechanism to ensure that people understand the value of these animals. And that takes me back to what uh, you know Paul mentioned about those who are spearheading development and the fact that either they are not being uh, in-depth enough in so far as what's happening. Now, one of the key issues within the Vision 2030 is the fact that natural resources, including wildlife, are actually the, the foundation of our economic development. And so if we build roads to you know, spy economic development, improve tourism, and yet that same same tourism depends on the survival of these habitats and the ecosystems, I mean, and the wildlife they are in, then it's, it, it kind of negates the entire value of that infrastructure because it's supposed to bring in tourists to view and take photographs and bring revenue, and yet the same incentive that's supposed to bring them home is what we are decimating and destroying. It means there's no connection in our minds on how these things work. So that entire what's called the socio-ecological thinking is actually left out. We are thinking socially, but leaving the ecological, and yet that is where all the survival pegs. So it, it actually goes much broader, uh, not just the construction of the roads and the bombs, but also what value or what role are they supposed to play in protecting biodiversity in those landscapes needs to be thought through and spoken more precisely to the people involved. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Tobias, uh, because I know the participants are asking plenty of questions and uh, we have uh, about uh, 10 minutes left because we had scheduled this webinar for two hours. And I now want to shift gear onto what I call the next course of action. And already Paul has uh, read my mind. And uh, Paul is asking a question in terms of, um, do we, do we, are there any plans in uh, using the results and observations from your study uh, to convert them into what we call policy briefs that can be focused um, in engaging government, uh, which I think it's a, a good, excellent idea. I would like us now to focus on the next course of action because at times we discuss about information. Then when information gets to our level, uh, we tend just to use that information for purposes of, um, of, uh, of for information or informing ourselves, but we hardly engage the relevant stakeholders with that information. And I think uh, one of the key actions that is coming out also in agreement with Paul's suggestion is to Tobias of preparing policy briefs to engage the government. It could be a review of the environmental management plan within the SGR component, uh, particularly for Nairobi all the way up to Nairobi, and engage NEMA on who is supposed actually to enforce the environmental management plan regarding its implementation. So I think we need to start focusing now on action areas and uh, you can actually post on the chat uh, what action area that you propose so that after this webinar, we'll be able to look at uh, summarizing uh, the actions that you will have put together and then also work with the relevant uh, organizations that are already <clears throat> dealing with the issues of um, infrastructure and development and see how we can push a case. And then also the other action that uh, I picked from uh, Joanne was the issue of strengthening uh, civil society voice, uh, particularly on the advocacy level, uh, so that as we strengthen that voice, we also rewrite the narrative that, or that civil society are anti-development, uh, so that we say we are not just anti-development because most of the beneficiaries of those uh, developments are actually us, and we also enjoy that, but would like what we call a sustainable development that ensures that there is a balance, uh, both in terms of, uh, of delivery of services, because most of this infrastructure upon the delivery of services, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that the trees are not cut off completely, uh, but there is an adequate sustainable balance in uh, working on that. And then uh, I've also uh, seen an action from Tobias, uh, regarding dissemination of uh, information, uh, because this information, once it is disseminated, then it's available to the public also for them to know so that information is not only uh, with, um, with CSO looking in that relevant 
with everybody. And then from there is when now we use the information that has been generated uh, to kind of be able to access that. So one of the things we are going to do after this presentation is we are going to, to put the research publication by Tobias onto the website of, uh, of um, CAK uh, so that everybody can access that information. And then we'll create a mechanism to work with organizations that are dealing with infrastructure to pick one, two, three actions that we can work on, particularly on engaging government uh, to see how some of the issues highlighted have been identified. So I would like to give participants an opportunity just to drop on the chat uh, whether there is any action that uh, I have left out uh, so that we are able to pick that. I had also seen that uh, a few hands were up and um, I would like to give those uh, people an opportunity to say as we think about the next course of actions, because we should be winding up the webinar in the next 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the interest that will be generated. But I can see Charles Tonui's hand is up, and I saw Koikai's hand also up, so I would like to give those two an opportunity. If there is anybody else, just kindly raise up your hand, I will give you an opportunity to. So Charles, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself, and then uh, you have the floor. And then next will be Koikai, if he's still around. Yes, Charles. Yes, uh, thank uh, Steve. Sorry, and, uh, just worked out a, a bit. Uh, uh, you are responding to my comment? Uh, no, I saw your hand was up because that was. Uh, yes. Yes. yes, I do it and I realize maybe the few minutes, 10 minutes could be over in a short while. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for ACC organizing things, this forum. I'm coming in from the perspective that I think there's a lot of discussions around the, the, the infrastructure, the design, and I'm trying to think of the policy space. And I was among some of the stakeholders who are involved during the green assessment, uh, the development of the green assessment report for for, for Kenya, uh, which culminated into the development of the green economic strategy and implementation plan in 2016. So when you look at the, especially the policy space when such incidents as like the electrocution of the three uh, giraffes and, and based on the infrastructure, which is really very important for the country. And you look in between the, the, the provisions of the of, of, of the policies. I think the non dead actors, of course, with the government, you have not done sufficient as uh, sufficient uh, work in terms of really providing <clears throat> some of the details and linking the policy provisions so that it can guide the practitioners when institutions like Kenya Power are erecting the line, the transport sector, they are doing their work, they can be guided uh, properly. I was looking like, for, for instance, the green economy strategy and it's taking us up to 2030. And, and you look at the, the provision, especially on uh, climate proving infrastructure and provision on natural resource management, promoting sustainable natural resource uh, resources as uh, restoration. So I, I think we need to support in terms of um, really linking the infrastructure and um, natural resource restoration and conservation because institutions like NEMA, of course, and um, you know, different uh, parastatals within the government will not be in position to proactively really operationalize these policy frameworks to target those specific sectors or subsectors or uh, activities regarding the wildlife if we don't do sufficient work. We already have, I think Kenya is one of the countries in Africa which has sufficient uh, or significant amount of uh, policies uh, within its uh, boundaries. But what we need to focus on is especially linking, you know, in terms of when you talk about climate proving infrastructure, because I remember when you were discussing climate proving, it was about to look at also the different aspects within the ecosystem. But we didn't, when you look at the, the, the promotion of sustainable resource, uh, natural resource restoration, we didn't link it directly to the infrastructure again. So you find there are gaps around that. And then of course, what uh, Tobias has presented in terms of now, the perception of the population and, and, and especially the road users. We need to bring in especially the policy makers, the county members of assembly and the parliamentary groups. I think they raised the previous year when we engaged them that we are not sufficiently con 
engaging, especially the NASED actors at the research level from the project design, the identification of issues, the preliminary findings and the outcomes. We normally bring them at the validation level when a lot of things have happened and they are also very busy. Thank you so much, uh, Etala. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for bringing that uh, perspective in terms of uh, climate pooling. And uh, also in this uh, list of participants, I can see other representatives from other sectors. Uh, I can see uh, my friend Murioki from, uh, from ICRAF also who is here, the forest and several other people. I would also want to see in terms of uh, how we can work with uh, other like-minded partners, uh, particularly the ones who are involved in agroforestry uh, and see how we deal with this issue of infrastructure because a lot of trees are also getting cut in the process of these infrastructure projects. So maybe uh, Murioki, uh, as uh, Koikai talks, you can uh, maybe just uh, let us uh, have a feeling of uh, where are possible areas of uh, collaboration uh, particularly in um, in this uh, infrastructure uh, initiative with uh, you guys who are working on the agroforestry sector. So I would like to hand over the mic to Koikai. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and uh, everybody else who have spoken. Uh, I think uh, it has been very enlightening, uh, except, uh, except the gaps definitely as uh, many have repeatedly said that uh, we are talking among ourselves and like-minded and sometimes the gap is that uh, the person people as individuals and the institutions uh, who uh, have a bigger impact on those areas that are uh, of, of concern are not involved what, are, what, what, what i think one approach because we are losing time and every everything you, you know we take a lot of time on these issues I am picking on what uh, Madam Lucy has mentioned about the uh, practical and pragmatic way of uh, Kruger and uh, the infrastructure mandated uh, government institution in South Africa. And uh, not to, because of institutional ego, maybe it is what level of starting to discuss to, to, to look at benchmarking. Benchmarking, for sure, it is one of the quickest way and it has got an incentive of people going out to, to see how to learn and then come and adapt as the, the shortest possible time because uh, we are running out, out of time. And uh, for example, I am looking at the, the infrastructure we have proposed uh, very sustainable, very good ideas for Amboseli, all the lands that are surrounding Amboseli that will be subdivided. Will the communities have well thought out about how to center themselves in central settlement areas and uh, the roads that will be coming with ideas of of, of uh, them going up rather than down because coming down it will still fragment uh, you, you know it will cut off the ecosystem possibly the best way for to cut off for the big egos of uh, big people in the other institutions and the institutional egos for that for that matter maybe we see on the short, shortest possible time on how to take out these people to go and see and then come back they are already uh, uh, with us and uh, uh, the policy angle and everything that is necessary for the people to listen with one stroke. I think it will be a good investment. We, I, I am, I'm, I'm thinking that is one of the shortest possible way because everybody is very aggressive going towards the direction of putting infrastructure and all that, and it can be too late and then we just be left uh, talking to ourselves and very depressed. Thank you. Thank you, Koikai. Uh, I think uh, that's quite in order and uh, we've noted your observation. Uh, Julia, sorry for pushing in the last minute. Is there anything you can comment on? Uh, possible areas of collaboration to see how we can work together with, uh, with the initiative? You can unmute yourself. Okay, he seems not to be there. Yeah, I think I think Julius is not there to discuss that. Uh, I think um, this is one of the, those sessions where you know we can go on and 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 go on because it's very very central. 
uh, to what we do on an everyday uh, basis. And um, I can see Lori has posted something. Uh, Tobias, what did you learn from them? What are we, we are doing a radio show in voice starting on human wildlife conflict this week. I think Tobias, uh, Lori is offering you an opportunity through the radio show that uh, mm -hmm. they have in the VOI area uh, to see whether there is anything that can be highlighted uh, regarding your research findings, uh, particularly when there is awareness on the human wildlife conflict this week. Mm -hmm. So I think Lori is extending an olive branch for you yes. to, to partner with her in that area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, we'll get in touch and see. I see you. I'm sure you've asked question in relation to the human wildlife conflict situation around uh, VOI, uh, which we've got some very interesting findings to share. So we'll, we'll get in touch after the webinar. OK. Great, Tobias. Any closing remarks? Uh, I think we are now coming to the tail end of the session. Any closing remarks from your end? Yeah, well, I think uh, Steve and uh, you know, thank you so much first of all for this opportunity. And I'm glad you know I didn't I didn't expect we'll uh, spend a lot of time on this, but I I now agree it's something that really bothered uh, so many of us uh, both in the conservation and development sector. And I really appreciate input from everybody and all the recommendations therein. As I mentioned, this is just one among all the other you know, materials or issues we are tackling. And I'll gladly be able to share with you as we go along. Uh, we haven't really concluded much of what's going on in the field, so we are still sharing information. But like I mentioned, this is an area that is pretty broad and it can't be tackled by one institution it's better tackled when you work as a team because it's a core issue of the government's operations. And I think one of the lessons I learned during these interviews was that uh, you know, one of the officials made a remark to me jokingly, but it came true, that my friend, uh, let me tell you one secret. When the government decides to do a project, you will jump so high, go so low, go under the bed, and when you wake up, the project will continue. And it kept ringing in my mind, particularly with an example of the SGR passing through the Nairobi National Park. Uh, when that happened, I was out of the country in the UK finishing my write-up, but I could follow a lot of activities with the phone up leading the, the fight, and I'm glad uh, you know, some of the participants are here. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning that I'm actually riding on your shoulders to do this in a different way. But if I were in during that time, I don't know what I could have done. So I thought with all the noise and all the, you know, the uh, expositions of what was supposed to be the impacts of the SGR within the park and other areas, the government actually still won and went ahead. So the lessons we might have learned were like, where did we not do things rightfully? Or why did we not win the war, if I would call it so? So this to me, I think is a starting point. And like I mentioned, if we are able to generate the evidence adequately and always use that as our shield, then we are likely to go further. And that calls into action every participant here who feels that something needs to be done, not in the interest of stopping development, but in the interest of having uh, you know, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient development. We wouldn't want a situation where several years down the road, all that infrastructure we're fighting about is abandoned because it's no longer useful to anybody. We have to speak to uh, the truth. Recently, you read about uh, the railway to nowhere and things uh, on, 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 a, on the newspapers. And of course, some of those things are becoming a reality. So why do we always have to wait to learn from our mistakes? We can learn from lessons learned elsewhere and seek local application here through these research processes, and it's got to be participatory. So once again, my last word is that we've started a process that brings us together and gives us an opportunity to work across different sectors and different institutions. Let's see it through and be able to have a dialogue with people who have always seen us as adversaries. We have an opportunity to engage with them and tell them we mean well for the country, just like you also mean well for the country. We have the same destiny and we have to protect it together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias, for those uh, closing remarks. Uh, in conclusion, uh, because I know we'd agreed on, uh, on uh, preparing some policy briefs to engage the government, I would just like to find out how many participants here are willing to be involved in the development of these policy briefs 
uh, so that we can use the information that has currently been gathered and see how we can target the various government agencies, including the legislators, parliament, both the national, the national assembly and the Senate and uh, the other relevant uh, government agencies by just show of hands. Is there any participant here who would be willing to participate in the process of uh, developing these policy briefs? Because we are getting into the area of action. Yes, I can see Evelyn's hand is up. Uh, please don't lower your hand, just keep your hand up. Sheila, help me capture the names of those people who are volunteering to participate in the in the review, just raise up your hand. I can see. Sheila, are you capturing the details? I can see Evelyn's hands. I can see yeah. Lori. I can see Paul. I can see Angela, uh, Charles, and uh, George. Yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have five volunteers. Uh, to help us in the element of preparing policy briefs. Uh, I think that would be a good action uh, from this meeting uh, so that we can, uh, we, can, we can get the sense of the feedback once we prepare the policy briefs and uh, get to see the essence of the feedback that we get, then it should be able to guide us in the next course of action. So for those volunteers who have done so, uh, kindly inbox Sheila your email address on the chat box so that she captures the details and then we will let you know when we convene the first meeting together with Tobias uh, to see how we develop those policy briefs. So with that. Uh, Steve, I think yes. I can get the details from the registrations they did. So I think I Oh, can you can get the details. Okay, fantastic. If you can get the details from the registration, then that is fine. So Sheila is going to get in touch with you uh, so that uh, we see how to move. Uh, Annabelle is asking, would you consider getting a peer agency professional lobbyist to interact with the government? Yes, we will actually do that. Uh, we will consider who is uh, who can present our case <laughs> in a manner where we are not seen to be anti-developers, uh, but we need to get uh, our issue presented uh, in a manner that um, is not controversial and it's not uh, uh, crossing shoulders and rubbing anybody's um, uh, space. So thank you so much, Annabella, for that. So with that in mind, I would like now to say thank you to everyone who participated in today's session. And also to alert you, we'll communicate uh, the date for the next session, which is going to look at climate change issues within the wildlife sector. And that's another area that's closely in, in, uh, you know, connected with the topic we've had today. Uh, so that we can see um, how we can ensure that we're actually mitigating on some of those issues that are affecting biodiversity conservation in this country. So thank you so much. And uh, we also look forward to hear uh, your feedback uh, about the session. You can always drop an email using the link that uh, you got on the Zoom invite just to give us a feedback on things that we can do better and how we are progressing with the conservation uh, for conversation. So thank you so much and do have uh, a lovely uh, day ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, and everybody else.